Brooklyn Independent Television. When a federally funded task force recently recommended a major change to the age when women should begin to get mammograms, you could say all health broke loose. It's a debate in which breast cancer screening statistics are at odds with very emotional personal stories. With me from Lutheran Medical Center are two physicians who deal with this issue every day. Dr. Audrey Saides is chair of radiation oncology and Dr. Ifat Hoskin is chair of obstetrics and gynecology and a senior vice president at the hospital. Thank you both for being here. It's true that this task force recommendation really caused a lot of uh, furor, I should say. Can you tell me the difference with, first with what the change in recommendations really are between the old guidelines, the old recommendations, and the new ones? I think the biggest difference between the old guidelines and the new recommendations is that we were offering screening to all women based on their age, and the age cutoff was 40 years. So we were saying that once they hit that age group, they were going to get an annual screening mammogram. And the biggest difference is that that now, we have told them that they should start at 50 versus the 40. We've also told them that after many, many, many years of telling them that they should do breast self-exams, we are now saying that they probably don't need to do that monthly because that's what we used to tell them before. You know, this raises two very important issues. I know, Dr. Saida, that you treat lots of women at Lutheran with breast cancer. Do you see women under 40 with breast cancer? Yes, we do. I've actually treated a patient as young as 25, and we do tend to see women in their 30s and their 40s as well. So it means that there are some women in their 20s, 30s, and 40s who need mammograms. Yes. I want us to be very sure about that because I don't want women calling up now and saying, I had a, an appointment for a mammogram, I want to cancel it. So there are still women that will need it. Yes, and I think that the uh, task force, and I, Dr. Hoskins will get into that a little more, is just guidelines. So if you're in the process of doing anything or you have uh, risk factors and everything, it's just very important to still speak to your physician, and you are supposed to make that decision along with your physician. And again, these are just guidelines. When, when uh, Dr. Saida keeps saying these are just guidelines, could you delineate, would you talk about a little bit the difference between having guidelines over here and me sitting in front of my physician, how it's handled? I think that's a very important question. The guidelines are for us, the providers, to give the patients information. So we can say that when this task force reviewed the outcomes, which is mortality, mm -hmm. reviewed the usefulness of the screening test, which in this case is a mammogram and a breast self-exam, that they identified that it wasn't necessary to do it every year when they looked at it as a general public intervention. Sitting in the doctor's office is more an informed decision. We can say to our patients, you know, approximately over 50% may be false positive. However, when we cast such a wide net of getting every woman to get the test, of course we have a better pickup rate. And if you happen to be the one who has that risk and that breast cancer, we will pick it up in that wide net, and the patient will then say, am I willing to accept the over 50% false positive rate, or do I want to lull myself into a different level of confidence? If it's an over 50% false positive rate, then that's another discussion. What is the workup of those patients to find that one? Well, I think the workup is part of the reason that they're recommending or some of the outcomes of doing mammograms and finding things that are not breast cancer. What are some of the downsides of actually doing a mammogram and saying you have a lump? Well, I think the downside is you're going, you're going to put the patient through anxiety. And for some patients, that's a lot. They have to undergo anesthesia, maybe that some people would look as unnecessary. They have to undergo a biopsy. And I think you have to, to some patients, it's better to be safe than sorry. But again, you have to have the discussion and you have to be able to go down that path that, okay, you know what, I'm going to maybe find an adenoma and it'll be fine. But the anxiety is the big thing that we're making a lot of women. We're not changing the outcome and we're making all these women and doing unnecessary testing and making them anxious when it could have just went away on its own. Well, 
There are two things about this. One is, would you talk about radiation exposure? Because I know that that's going to come up in the discussion uh, as the anxiety being not being a cancer, and I'm sure there are people out there saying, what about the radiation people are getting? Yeah, and, that, and that's a good <coughs> point again, because that's always a fear. And that actually, in this task force, that's not why they're not saying that the ed exposure at starting at that young of age actually causes the cancer. What they looked at and what I think the confusion is, and Dr. Hoskins pointed out good, is they're just looking at the outcome. They're saying that if we find it at 40 or we find it at 50, it's not going to change. We're not, it doesn't look like we're saving lives. But one of the criticisms of this is that they didn't take into account digital mammography. They're looking back at older kind of testing. So I think that and you may want to, speak, you know, digital mammography is a little bit more specific. And I think it's also very important from an oncology point of view, and the patients have to understand that we find it earlier. They avoid chemotherapy. And if we go back to finding larger lesions, right now we find lesions that are very, very small, and we can preserve the women's breast, and they can avoid chemotherapy. So that also although it may not change the ultimate outcome, it does, I think, play a role in why we screen a little earlier. The other, the other point is, is that not only can you do digital mammography, but if you have to do a biopsy, and you can speak to this, don't you do a uh, guided biopsy now so that they're not, you're not just going in there and cutting and, and so forth, but would you talk about um, um, radiation, r radiologic, guided mammography yes. or biopsy. Biopsy. Yeah. Yes. You know, when we find a lump, uh, whether it's come up from a mammogram, whether it's come up by a patient finding it herself, the next step is to see is it a false positive or is it a true positive. So oh, those women need a biopsy. It's very directed. My hand can be directed by a screen where I can say it's a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. I can hone in exactly on that area, which makes it very accurate and focused. And that actually is very helpful, not only in terms of getting a good di diagnosis and a good specimen for the patient's comfort. I'm not in there digging around, so to speak, looking at a wider area. That makes a big difference. You know, before we go, there's a question that I have to ask. Is this a way of rationing? I know we're not supposed to say that word, but I have to ask it. Is, are these guidelines a way of rationing resources? Well, I'm, if you want to call it rationing, that's okay, but I look at it, and I'm sure many of the clinicians look at it, as we have finite resources. There's X amount of slots for mammography, X amount of checkup appointments, et cetera. Given that the majority of the women who get these tests are normal, therefore retrospectively, in hindsight, I grant, we didn't need them for these. So you have the uh, resources of the mammogram machine, the doctor's visit, or whatever it may be, and we're casting a very wide net and including a lot of normals in there. And what the task force, I looked on it as trying to guide us to say, if you focus a little bit differently, you're trying to go to that area where you're more likely to find the positive, and that seems to be in the higher age group above 40. So it's not, it's, it's more efficient use of resources in these days of construction constrained resources. That's one, the way I looked at it. Now, the last thing I say in this few minutes the, the, that we have left, in the minute or so we have left, when a woman is sitting in front of her doctor and she's 39 years old and the doctor says, I'm recommending that you have a mammogram, and this is a woman who reads the New York Times and she whips it out and she says, the guidelines said, I don't meet, need a mammogram until I'm 40 and I don't need to do self-breast examination. What would you tell her? Well, I would tell her, yes, the guidelines do say that. However, let's talk a little bit about you. Find out if you have risk factors, find out what your habits are, and even if you're absolutely normal and uncomplicated, I am comfortable to offer you the mammography test, provided you and I have an agreement that we accept that there's a high rate of false positives, which will lead down the pathway that Dr. Saida said of the biopsy, the further testing, et cetera, and it's a time, it's effort, it's the family stress, all that has to go as the ultimate cost of doing those tests. Mm -hmm. Thank you both very much for being with us. Brooklyn Independent Television on the BCAT TV Network.